Go somewhere you don't understand. That's the first thing. Get thee out of thy country. You know, back in the 1920s, there was a whole slew of American writers who ended up as expatriates in Paris, Hemingway among them, and, uh, the, and who wrote The Great Gatsby. Fitzgerald, yes, and then a variety of others. It was very inexpensive in Paris at the time, and part of their transformation into great literary figures was the fact that they were out of their country, and now they could see what their country was, because you can't see what your country is until you leave it. So you have to go into the unknown, and that's, that's God's first command. Go into the unknown, because you already know what you know. And so, and that's not enough unless you think you're enough. And if you're not enough and you don't think you're enough, then you have to go where you haven't been. And so that's the first commandment to Abraham. It's like, okay, that, that's a good one. That makes perfect sense. Go to where you don't know. Yes. And from thy kindred. Well, that, what does that mean? It means grow up. Right? That's what it means. It means get away from your family enough so that you can establish your independence. And that isn't because there's something wrong with your family, although perhaps there is, you know, as there is perhaps wrong with you. But it means get away. You know, I talk to people very frequently whose families have provided them with too much protection. And they know it themselves. And that means they're deprived of necessity. You know, one of the things that you see in, in, in the United States, for example, is that... Um, the children of first-generation immigrants often do better than, the chil- than, the, than their children. And the reason for that is that the children of first-generation Im- immigrants have necessity driving them. And you don't know how much you need necessity to drive you because maybe you're not very disciplined. And if a catastrophe doesn't immediately befall you if you don't act forthrightly today, then maybe you never act forthrightly, right? Because the, the, the gap between your foolishness and the punishment is, is lengthened by your unearned wealth and so you never grow up and learn and you have to get yourself away from your dependency in order to allow necessity to drive you forward and that's to become independent and to become mature and I think part of what's happening in our culture is that the 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 force that's attacking the the forthright movement forward of young men in particular is afraid of the power of men because it's confused about the distinction between power and authority and competence. Like, a, a man who's, who has authority and competence has power as a byproduct, but the authority and competence is everything. And, and, and people who can't understand that fail to make the distinction between power and authority and competence, and they're afraid of power, and so they destroy authority and competence. And that's a terrible thing, because we need authority and competence. What else is going to... What else is going to allow us to prevail in the long run? And so you get away from your country and you get away from your kin and from your father's house, right? And you go out there and you establish yourself in the world. It's a call to adventure. That's what this, the the first lines in the Abrahamic story is a call to adventure. One of the things that... I've been struck very hard by a number of writers, Carl Jung, obviously, among them. I mean, he, he wrote things like Nietzsche that, if you understand them, they just break you into pieces, you know? And, and one of the things that Jung understood and the psychoanalysts understand is one of the most terrifying elements of psychoanalytic thinking is very tightly allied with religious thinking, which is that you are not the master of your own house. There are spirits that dwell in you, within you, meaning... You have a will and you can exercise a certain amount of conscious control over your being, but there are all sorts of things that occur within you that seem to be beyond your capacity to control. Your dreams, for example, that's a really good example, or your impulses, for example, you might, you might think of those as so foreign from you that they're not even, you don't even want them to be part of you. But, but more subtly even, how about what you're interested in, what compels you? Like, where does that come from? Exactly. Because you can't, you can't, conjure it up of your own accord, you know? So if you're a student and you're taking a difficult course, you might say to yourself, well, I need to sit down and study for three hours. But then you sit down and that isn't what happens. Your attention goes everywhere. And you might say, well, whose attention is it then if it goes everywhere? Because you say it's your attention. It's like, well, if it's your attention, maybe you would be able to control it, but you can't. And so then you might think, well, Jen, just exactly what the hell is controlling it? And you might say, well, it's random. It's the, well, it better not be random. I can tell you that. That's, that happens to some degree in schizophrenia. There's an element of randomness in that. It's not random. 
It's driven by the action of, of phenomena that I think are best considered as something like subpersonalities, although even that's only a partial description. You can't make yourself interested in something. Interest manifests itself and grips you. That's a whole different thing. And so what is it that's gripping you? And, and how do you conceptualize that? Is that a divine power? Well, it's divine as far as you're concerned because it grips you and you can't do anything about it. And so there's a calling in you towards what you're compelled by and what you're interested in. And sometimes that might be very dark and sometimes not. But you're compelled forward by your interest. And so, and so the idea that what moves you away from your country and your father's house and the comforts of your child at home is, is something that's beyond you and that you listen to and hearken to. That's exactly right. And you can say, well, I don't want to call that God. It's like, it doesn't matter what you call it exactly. It doesn't matter to what it is, what it's called. It still is. And if you don't listen to it, that's the other thing. If you don't listen to it, and I've been a clinician and talked to enough people now, as old as I am, to know this absolutely. If you do not listen to that thing that beckons you forward, you will pay for it like you cannot possibly imagine. You'll have everything that's terrible about life in your life and nothing about it that's good. And worse, you'll know that it was your fault and that you squandered what you could have had. The worst punishment is reserved for those who committed to nothing and stayed on the fence. And that's really something too. That's really something to think about. And it's also something I believe to be true because I see that stasis is utterly destructive because there's no progress all there is is movement backwards there's aging and suffering and no progress and so to not commit to anything is the worst of all transgressions to commit means to put your body and soul into something to offer your life as a sacrifice means that you're willing to make a bargain with fate and the bargain is I'm going to act as if if I give it my all then the best possible thing will happen because of that and to to not see the analogy between that and the, the act of faith in God is to misunderstand the story completely. And it has to be an act of faith because how are you going to know? You can look at other people, but that isn't going to do it. It's, it. Kierkegaard was very clear about this sort of thing. There's certain sorts of truths that you can only learn for yourself through experience. And that's, of course, why Abram also has to go out alone, right? He has to leave his kin. It's, it's an individual, it's the individuation process. Like dying, it's something that you do alone. There's no way you can tell what is within your grasp, let's say, unless you make the ultimate sacrifice. And there's no way of finding out without actually making it. Sacrifice, what does that mean, sacrifice? Well, it's a discovery, man. It's the discovery of the future. It's like the future is actually the place where there is threat. And it's always going to be there. So what do you do? You make sacrifices in the present so that the future is better. Right. Everyone does that. That's what you're doing right now. That's what you're doing here. That's what your parents are doing when they pay money to send you to university. They think, you can bargain with reality. It's amazing. You can bargain with reality. You can forestall gratification now. And it'll pay off at a, at a place and time that doesn't even exist yet. It's like... Who would have believed that? It's like, that's a miracle that that occurs. And it's not like people just figured that out overnight. You know, we were chimps for Christ's sake. Like, how are we gonna come up with an idea like that? Well, it's like, well, we thought about it for seven million years. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where we could kind of act it out. But we didn't know what we were doing. But it was a, it emerged like a dream. It was, so the terror of the future is a dream. And the solution to the terror, the dream of the terror of the future, is another dream. And, and it, it comes out in mythology and in fantasy and in drama, where you act out the sacrifice. And then it's a step on the way to full understanding. So we can say sacrifice now instead of doing it, you know, although we still do it. It's just not concretized like it used to be. We do it abstractly. And we all have faith that it will work. You know, and we also set up our society so that it'll work. And, one thing about, you know, I'm not a fan of moral relativism for, for a variety.
variety of reasons, partly because I think it's an, it's an extreme form of cowardice. But anyways, apart from that, no, 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 no. There's minimal ways that you can set up a society that will work. And so one of them is, is that the society has to be set up so that your sacrifices will pay off or you won't work and then the society will die. And so it has to make promises. People have to make promises to one another. And that's what money is. Money is a promise that your sacrifice will pay off in the future. That's what money is. And so if the society is stable, you can store up your work right now. You can sacrifice your impulses and you can work and you can store up credit for the future. And then you can make the future a better.